Uh, I'd like to introduce Professor Latanya Sweeney. She's going to jump in line here and uh, give us her views. Professor Sweeney, thank you. My head is really uh, going back and forth in all kinds of directions. When I sat through the first panel, I was like, oh, this is what I want to say. And then when I go follow him, this is a whole different talk. So uh, I'll just go back to my original talk. Um, and in, in in particular, um, I, what I want to talk about is actually um, how the world of geospatial information and openness um, abuts against these issues of privacy with respect to privacy laws. And in many ways, geospatial information, and I guess I should just give you a little bit of a background. Uh, my expertise is in privacy technology, sort of how do you use technology to assess or solve government or societal problems. I've had the most impact in uh, data privacy. And I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. But clearly, geospatial information joins a constant stream of data types that have preceded it and technological innovations that are transforming our lives uh, in really fantastic ways. But at the same time, they keep challenging our past approaches at how we go about protecting ourselves with respect to data sharing. So I'm not going to talk about the benefits and the improvements that geospatial information provides. I think uh, many others have talked about that. But I'm going to spend the five minutes remaining to talk about how geospatial data has been historically addressed in data and how it does challenge our policy regimes and how our policy regimes think about it. And I also pro propose some thoughts towards solutions. Some of these observations are taken in part from a book that I have forthcoming called Who Controls Your Data? Um, there is no one party regime or policy in the United States that controls your personal information or including your geo, personal geospatial information. Data sharing pl takes place in a context and to understand it you basically have to understand who are the parties, what are their rules or engagement and just sort of dissect it into benefits and risk. And where you sit in this community is basically at the forefront of this. That is, as you go forward, you'll see that the policies are of zero help to you. Uh, and if you try to use them, it's not going to be very helpful. But on the other hand, constructing new paradigms will be helpful. And so thinking about it in these ways, I think you'll find useful. So what are these ways and what are these policies? So there are usually three parties involved in a data sharing arrangement. The subject of the data, the entity receiving the data, and the entity providing the data. Now sometimes the subject of the data is one or the other two, and sometimes not. Revenue streams, regulations, laws, technology design combine in very different ways to establish what the actual rules of engagement will be. And they often do, away, do so in a way that creates a power imbalance. That is, they favor one entity over the others. They allow those in control to enjoy the benefits while others may risk the harms. And the real trick when you're constructing these systems and these data sharing arrangements is to try to either align the benefits and the risk or to realize the benefits with minimal, uh, with minimal risk or guarantees that limit the risk. So as we turn forward, we will look towards technology design for the best possible ways forward. Uh, and personalized decision making, because that's something that's made possible. The previous panel spoke to it often about, especially um, the, uh, the civic talk where she talked about, let's put back our data and so forth. Those are the kinds of ways as we move forward uh, that offer us some of the most promise. But what can we learn from the past in our past policies? Well, let me have you first consider some real world examples from public health and from health care. So we'll start with the case of lead poisoning, which is reported to the New York City Public uh, Health Department as an attempt to balance risk and utility in data sharing arrangements. So during a trip to the pediatrician, young children are required by state law to be tested for lead poisoning, often originating when young children eat paint chips from paint containing lead, a child with lead poisoning will suffer a lifetime of developmental problems. So New York City law requires children who are tested and all the results that from that test to be re forwarded to the New York City Public Health Department. The Public Health Department, in turn, is responsible for taking action against landlords. So as part of governmental oversight and the demand of communities, lead poisoning results must be made public so that the public is aware of the nature and extent of the problem and can also oversee the actions taken by the Public Health Department. 
The problem that is, is, is if the geolocations are provided, the children could be identified and discriminated for life. If the locations are not provided, those, then the public good cannot really be served because the public could remain at risk or there may be partiality in enforcement. So there's clearly a risk of re-identification of children using publicly available health data, uh, which is required by another state law that I'll mention as my second example. But, and so if these point locations are shared, i.e. just address locations, then we can actually re-identify these children. So an idea that's not so good is say we use a different point location. We just randomly choose another location. And of course the problem there is that you may actually be inferring uh, or imposing damage on another real estate property or even on another child. Another idea that doesn't work particularly well is to say I'm going to not report the specific point location, but I'm just going to add, produce a circle around that location of some uh, size. And the problem there, of course, is that uh, one, when we link it to health information, that child might still be the only one, and therefore you didn't really achieve the goal. Or, uh, or uh, the fact that so many points have the same kind of radius or roughly the same radius allows us to pinpoint the, the, the uh, location. So one solution that has been uh, adopted to some extent is reporting a geographically wide area known to have incidents of other children. And that's a way that remains faithful to the original value, uh, but if you have other data and you attempt to deconstruct it, you end up with multiple matches for which you can't be certain. So that's one example. So, but what about this health data that we would otherwise link it to? How do they go about dealing with that? So the policy framework took there was is, a, is the most common framework we see in policy with respect to data sharing. And the idea is that if I could remove this risk of re-identification, this risk that I could figure out who the person who's the subject of the data might be, I can share the data widely. It can go freely without harm because after all, if you can't be re-identified in the data, then there can't be any harm. And sometimes it will offset uh, the utility of the data, will we'll suffer a little bit of a loss. So almost every state in the United States has passed a law about a decade or more ago that requires hospitals to report um, patient information about every patient visit. Uh, and most states also include ambulatory care that would be visits to the physician's office. That includes demographics about the patient as well as diagnosis and procedure codes. Um, and once collected, the state then uh, takes away the patient's name and so forth, and then either sells the data or makes the data freely available. So after all these years of operation, we might think that we could look to these state collections for advice about how, what kind of geocoding would be a good idea. And so in fact, we recently uh, just surveyed them all, all 50 states, and we found dramatic, variabil dramatic variability among the states, no, no complete agreement. But almost all of them tended to over-redact the data, or redact it very crudely, i.e. only reporting the first three digits of the zip code. So that's a huge difference in the, in the utility. So the other thing that's interesting about that is HIPAA. So HIPAA is our federal law. It's the, the health, in, health Information Portability and Accountability Act. It's the federal regulation in the United States that dictates privacy. It is probably the number one model currently used that if a new law had to happen right away, uh, it's typically the model that will be used. I are, there is currently a lot of discussion in DC about replacing what we currently do through IRBs and research to be replaced with a HIPAA model. And so understanding how HIPAA deals with geospatial information I think is really important. So HIPAA has what it calls the safe harbor provision. And the idea of the safe harbor provision is that if you do this, these things to your data, you're free from any penalties or risk or even free of HIPAA anymore, and you can do whatever you want with the data. You could put it online and so forth. So what is it that they, what are these rules? Well, the rules are the dates have to be reported in years, and you can give the five digits of the zip code dropping the first, la, uh, on, but only the first two digits if the population is less than 20,000. So that's year of birth, 
and five-digit zip codes except for in smaller populations where we only give the first two digits. In all of our surveys of those 50 states that have the hospital discharge data, that inpatient and outpatient data, of all of the surveys of all of the federal, rate, federal data that's made available on many of the sites in the open government sites, absolutely zero of them adhere to the HIPAA safe harbor. They all adhere to a stronger standard. So this tells us two things. It tells us that, so there are, there are a couple of lessons hidden in that, those examples. So one of them is that if forced to produce a law today, Congress will turn to HIPAA. HIPAA will prescribe a geographical, geo, some type of geospatial relationship that will both destroy the data and still not necessarily protect privacy. We'll talk in just a second about are they very good at, are these rules good, any good at protecting privacy? And, um, and so the challenge for this community is really to figure out how to leverage technology to do something better. So let me say why after all of that, no matter how much aggregating I do on these zip codes and so forth, that these challenges still remain in terms of privacy. So in 1997, I showed how demographics that appeared in medical data could be linked to population registers like a voter list to re-identify people by name. Perhaps uh, my earliest example that's most well known is William Weld when he was governor of Massachusetts. He lived here in Cambridge. His data, he had collapsed, so his data did appear in some publicly available medical data redacted along the lines of HIPAA uh, dictates and it turned out uh, that he was uniquely identified. That particular data, though, had his full date of birth, not just his year of birth. Most recently, we, uh, in fact, last week, we just released a new study revisiting the same, same vulnerability, uh, re-identifying genetic and medical data of participants in the Personal Genome Project. These are online profiles. We re-identified them, and we were 84 to 97 percent correct for the names that we provided. So in general, these demographics and other data keep combining. Geospatial data will keep combining. And, it keeps, and we can find all kinds of new ways. I could come back in 10 years. That was 97. I could come back in 10 years, and I could be citing the same thing, because the fundamental issue is those paradigms don't really work well. And so as we move forward, we have to seek new ways. Um, in terms of your own demographics, though, we did set up a website for the public a couple of weeks ago called aboutmyinfo.org, and you can go there and see what your, how unique you are by your demographics. Okay, and I'm at my last sentence. How's that? Is that good? So in concluding, our past approaches tend to view the risk and sharing through the lens of re-identification. Um, I think the future um, requires a technology-powered solution. Thank you. Thank you very much.